50 years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers, this time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. Space job was an internship out at Johnson uh, while I was getting my MBA here. I was working in the technology transfer office, um, helping them value technology as it was being spun out into to businesses. Um, this was before Elon had ever had a successful first flight, so the idea of space startups was still really crazy. Now it's kind of crazy today, but 10 years ago it was really crazy. Um, but we're start, uh, uh, what's so exciting to me is the change in that environment that I've been able to witness over the last decade. Um, uh, my partner and I recently founded Space Fund, which is a venture capital firm investing in those space startups. Um, as you're starting to see this major economic change in space, while it's always thrilling and exciting and wonderful and I'm happy to support in any way I can the, the great work that our governments and other governments are doing, um, the real shift lately has been how much of this is commercial. The commercial resupply to the ISS, soon the commercial astronauts to the ISS, and all of the hundreds and thousands of companies that are benefiting from that shift to a more commercial perspective, especially in LEO, as NASA moves out to the moon and Mars. Um, so we're very interested from the finance side on obviously capitalizing on that, um, and that's really where my interest in, and background Good afternoon. I'm the token non-Rice graduate on the panel here. <laughs> I'm Chris Culbert. Um, I lead the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program that Mark mentioned earlier. Um, I've been at JSC now for 38 years. It's been a long time. I was fortunate to come straight out of college right into JSC. A lot has changed over the last you know, 30 plus years at Johnson Space Center, but some things remain the same. We still are deeply committed to putting people into space. That's what Johnson Space Center is all about. But what's changed a lot is how we want to do that, how we go about it. And we'll spend some time talking a bit about um, some of the opportunities that represents for the things you all are interested in, the things that you might have a chance to do in your careers. 
this has been a, a marvelous place to do interesting work. And Johnson Space Center is at the center of an awful lot of very important things to get it done. But that's changing. The universe that you all will work in, the careers you have, will look very different. You'll have different opportunities. You'll have an opportunity to make impact in ways that don't depend upon NASA deciding everything. So I think we'll have an interesting discussion. I look forward to it. Hi, I'm Amy Kwan. I got my uh, bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Rice back in 05. Um, I was also an intern at JSC uh, when I was in school. Um, then I went to UT Austin for my master's in mechanical engineering before uh, joining the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Um, I've been lucky to be a mechanical integration engineer um, during my career. I first started working on the Curiosity rover um, that you're probably familiar with on Mars. Um, I've also worked on Juno, so these days if you see fantastic new pictures of Jupiter out there, that's probably from what Juno is sending back. Um, I've also worked on Mars Helicopter, which we're very excited about, uh, to go with the 2020 rover this July. And right now I'm working on the Europa Clipper mission, um, which will be going to Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, um, sometime soon in the 2020s. Great, okay, so let's get started. Um, the first question that I have for you guys is, um, how do you feel um, exploring the moon will help with the planning for you know, exploring the Mars, or also perhaps settling? So one of the great things and the great partnership between NASA and industry is, you know, when NASA says we go, we look at industry and industry says we do, right? And so, and when you look at the Moon to Mars initiative and the Artemis mission, we're all in. Um, when we work and not the work that I do, both as an engineer and then as a long-term business plan approach for working with our NASA partners is, is across the board, right? On the Boeing Starliner system and commercial crew, lowering the cost of assured and safe access to the International Space Station and building that lower urban economy, which allows NASA and the good faith dollars of the American taxpayer to go forward to push the technology uh, portfolio on critical needs we have to go to the moon, to stay on the moon. Uh, the incredible investment and the importance of the space launch system and the rocket to go to the moon. The fact that in a time of transition, this rocket and this program and this uh, mission has been enduring uh, to keep the, some amazingly critical skills for this United States of America in the area of human spaceflight intact um, and is now coming to fruition. Or the rocket that is at the B-2 test stand in Mississippi is the rocket that will take us around the moon. Um, and so a shirt axis of an 8.4 meter size diameter to entrepreneurs, to other companies, to the lunar lander provides a fertile, uh, sustainable, and assured payload of which you can be really creative to test and further technologies. Um, and so when, as we work in our portfolio and also working on space station and pushing the boundaries of long-term sustainable space flight and maintaining and working with NASA every day on space station operations, you have the greatest opportunity uh, to come and help that. And so one, lowering the cost where you know you have assured technical integrity and understanding of your systems allows you to invest in research and development in partnership with NASA on the technologies you need to go land on the moon. A robust, large rocket, which is basically a wide open etch a sketch of what can you launch up there in a very robust and sustainable way. And then very soon, uh, the, the human lander system. So getting there and then creating the ecosystem. I think it's something that all of us, whether you work in NASA industry, are all in for. That's what we're going for. And I can't forget my good friend Larry Price with Orion. You know, these are the integral puzzle pieces that will make that happen, and they exist today, and that's something that is very important for us to understand in terms of what the future has for for investment and to open that market. Oh, okay. Sure. 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 Sure.
utilizing the moon as a way to get ready for Mars in the same sense that we use ISS to help us understand what we need to do to get ready for longer duration missions and how humans adapt is very critical. And moon gives us the opportunity to do that kind of testing environment that, while it's not friendly, is at least relatively close. You can't defy physics. You need a lander to go to the moon, <laughs> right? So having a system that gives you the sustainable access that takes away the uh, questioning of sustainability, you can't help but use an iconic image of the first woman on the moon and say we are there and we are now here to stay. That opens up for us sustainability in terms of mission and our engineers uh, dialing in the technologies that have margin because when you go for the first time, when you design something for the first time, when you launch and test something for the first time, you're learning. And so uh, you're going to tweak the technology that you know is robust enough to get the first woman on the moon and then make it even better, more efficient. The ability to then carry more cargo um, is one. And then two, uh, I think NASA's approaches of, of commercial and, and the industrial base is, is important because um, as NASA goes, as you understand, and as NASA understands the environment which you're landing, they go on the next very big giant leap. And with that comes the commercial partnership and the commercial technologies along with that. Um, but yeah, you can't be physics, you need a lander, but that will mean so much for all of the partners involved. And so, my, as I mentioned earlier, my perspective is a little different, right? It's not so much from the technology side, it's from the economic and the financing side. And for me, the, the thing that will help the most with, um, with the US specifically, being successful at being a leader both on the moon and Mars, is developing that robust commercial ecosystem, developing the entrepreneurial ecosystem, because that's where you're gonna get the really innovative technologies. Uh, no offense to the big companies and, 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 the, uh, and NASA itself, but oftentimes innovation can be very slow the bigger an organization gets. So the more the entrepreneurial environment is, is tapped for these technologies, um, the quicker you'll see the pace of innovation. And so for me, that's the really exciting part about what's happening right now. And also when you look at commercial uh, crew, commercial cargo, having multiple suppliers, having multiple people innovate on these technologies um, just gets us to that goal faster. So the more companies, the more um, NASA programs and NASA funding we have, the faster we can get there and the more technologies we can create and the more robust technology portfolio we'll have because you can have multiple technologies coming from multiple places to solve the same problem. What I wanted to say about that is we have to work on the reliability of all the technologies that keep our astronauts alive. We have a lot of work that we've done on, say, water recovery. Um, we have to make sure that that is long-term stable and reliable. And then also, um, as Tony mentioned, we need that reliable means of transportation to the moon or to Mars or wherever we go. As part of my job, part of my group, um, we tend to take our spacecraft, usually, to the Cape in Florida to launch it. And it's, it's a very big logistical problem to take all of our ground support equipment, all of our flight hardware, all of our people, all the way across the country. Now imagine that this much more difficult when you're launching all this stuff into space. For our case, how many tractor trailers do you need? What kind of special route are you gonna take? All those overpasses, sometimes the trucks don't fit under those. Um, so you're looking at a, a logistical problem on that scale and multiplying it because of all the um, resources and the time it takes to prepare each launch that you're going to send into space. One thing I'll add to all that, Tony, Tony mentioned it earlier. We have to remember, a lot of you in this room know this, but a lot of people don't know it. There were two failed attempts to land on the moon the last year. Landing on the moon is not easy. So lander systems are critical to being able to actually accomplish anything we want to do.
you know, we mentioned uh, the our interplanetary missions as well, very critical part of our NASA portfolio. Um, solar cells, right? When you push the boundaries of solar cell efficiency um, at a company as big as Boeing, we also have pockets where this, these innovations really go out to market. For example, Spectralab is one of our companies, and that benefits life on Earth. You know, while I've always been just in awe of the relationships we have here at Rice and the Texas Medical Center for long-term sustainable uh, space flight from a human perspective and the human interaction perspective. Um, the technologies that we work with on the International Space Station, you know, my team of engineers every day creates the uh, box, if you will, that uh, experimenters can take their technologies, their uh, medical experiments, and their uh, external payload type uh, uh, material type experiments to the International Space Station, and that makes our life lighter, that makes our life simpler, that makes our life faster uh, back here on Earth. And uh, you see that, I see it more tactically from a human spaceflight targeted mindset, but then you see that at a macro level with those that are launching satellites right now to expand uh, internet, for example, right? So it, it, it works both ways on the benefits of pushing that envelope uh, for the benefit of all humankind. The way I like to think about this, and I think kind of probably one of the um, best recent historical um, comparisons would be the settling of the American West, right? Um, I imagine most of you went to high school in the United States and learned some US history, maybe you Remember the big thing, um, even before the gold rush, that the American government was pushing out to settle the West. And the way that this typically happened is that a fort would be built, a US government fort. And then what happens is what naturally, the naturally, natural evolution of this is that you start to get traders hanging out at that port, at that, at that location. And then you start to see little villages pop up around the fort. And then all of a sudden you've got an economic system and, and you then you take a picture of a fort on the American West, and 100 years later, it's a little museum with skyscrapers all around it, right? And that's how most of these Western cities were formed. And so um, we expect something similar to happen on the moon, right? Once the US is there, once that first fort is established, there's a place to go, there's a place to do business, then the economics will grow from there. And so I think what you're seeing with the Artemis program is the beginning of an entirely new economic system um, that will uh, create an off-world um, economy that we can all benefit from. And just like with the settling of the new, new world and, this, um, and the settling of the American West, the benefits that come back to the home world are not what you expect, right? Um, they didn't expect gold from the American West. They didn't expect um, the, how, how, uh, how much people could make off of furs and trading furs when, when um, they were originally settling the Northeast United States. So we don't know what that big, um, that big product is going to be, um, but it's going to be very interesting to find out. So I, I, I like Megan's example. <clears throat> Turns out Apollo wasn't much of a fort, was it? <laughs> um, and that's why we are where we are today. That's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, it's clear we need a different approach towards doing business in space if we want to create the economics that have a long-term sustainable effect. Um, NASA has to look at these kinds of the differences, uh, these kinds of systems differently. We need to partner with industry differently. We need to talk about the mechanism differently. We need a much broader um, swath of civilization to participate and benefit from it. I think Megan's exactly right. The benefits you get back generally aren't necessarily the things you thought you were starting out to look for. The, but history has taught us very clearly that the benefits emerge, and they, the people who are prepared to take advantage of that are the ones that get the, the net effect. I think the other thing that we can gain commercially is that as we explore the solar system more and discover more about other planets, we may also learn more about our own. Because sometimes certain things are, might not be obvious because we've been dealing with our own geology for so long, but when we look at a different planet, oh, is this how this, how this uh, developed? Or are there other minerals or whatever that you find here? Maybe we have other places to look on our planet for stuff like that. Um, do you think as climate change worsens, the push for settling on other planets, like Mars, because everyone keeps talking about getting to Mars, would you think that would become more strong like the urge to Two thoughts. First off, it's almost assuredly easier to clean our current planet than to get to Mars. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> at least in scale in, their, in a way that would represent change. But here's a thought I will give you. The kinds of problems we have to solve to keep humans in space alive for long spans of time, you've mentioned some of this already, are very similar to the kinds of problems we need to solve on this planet to handle some of the climate control problems and other, other problems associated with waste and, and sustainability. I agree with that. If uh, certain people were trying to, say, terraform Mars, the, the methods by which you would go about that would be ways that we could, say, keep uh, the ocean from inundating coastlines if we were motivated to do so on Earth. I don't, I don't think that, as, as he said, there, it's way easier to clean this planet than to fix another one. Mars is a real fixer-upper, okay? Um, but I do think that you are going to see space as a place of business and a place of research fundamentally change how we look at climate change and, and possibly even offer some solutions. Um, I think that obviously what we know about climate change, all of that data comes from satellites. Um, and I think that um, over the coming years, you'll see that it increasingly become a way that we both monitor and help mitigate climate change. You know, as a builder of systems, uh, whether for space or for air travel or personal mobility, um, as a tactical thinker, as an engineer through and through, um, when you look at the way you manage space, the way you manage risk, the risk and reward of, of being our Earth is our Earth, um, and pushing the boundaries of human spaceflight knowledge interaction in a hostile location right, has a direct benefit to industries across the board. Whether you take the mentality of NASA's risk and, and management style over to uh, energy systems, whether you take the uh, technologies that you build for human-rated spacecraft or long-term solar power needs or things that are 100% sustainable solutions in any X category you can fit and give it over to the mining industry or give it over to uh, systems engineering approaches for logistics. All of that is for the benefit of Earth. And I think that's also a secondary impact of what you're seeing with these investments for deep space is that it impacts other industries back home to be more efficient. And efficiency helps the bottom line, but more importantly, as we all get older, you see these macro forces of what is a good company, a company also makes life better on Earth um, as a result of this far forward thinking uh, with NASA as a, as a leader there. And I do want to say one more thing. we got to give a shout out to Jeff Bezos real quick because a big part of his solution here is if you take all of that industrial mining, uh, the industrial activity, all that nasty, dirty stuff that's hurting our environment, if you start doing that off world, um, that prevents a lot of the, the problems from starting in the first place. So um, asteroid mining. It's a thing. <laughs> um, what do you think are the toughest challenges we will have to overcome to create a sustainable human space program? For example, for humans living and working in space in the RSS or the moon or maybe Mars or beyond. You know, the obvious place to start, Mark already mentioned it, and somebody asked me a question about it. It, it really <clears throat> A discussion of alignment of priorities uh, at, the, at the national level and at the company level. Um, space is not for the faint-hearted. It's not for the people who've got a little bit of money. <laughs> there used to be a long joke a long time ago that if you wanted to make a small fortune in space, start out with a big one. <laughs> um, but we're no longer in an environment, I would argue, and we, some of the other panels might want to join in this discussion some, it isn't a technological question so much anymore, uh, particularly a lot in lower forward, okay? There are some challenges as you get further out into space, particularly with humans. But it's now more a discussion of aligning priorities and of finding the objectives that get groups of people to get their interests synced up. And that turns out to be one of the more harder things humans can do, right? Just watch the way our national discourse is going these days. Getting people to agree on things is hard. It isn't so much technology anymore. Now it's getting everybody to agree on what the right objectives are and agreeing to move them the same way. I agree 100%. You know, a lot of the people in this room have contributed significantly to solving those technological problems. And um, every technological program, problem we come up against as a country, we find a solution for. I'm not worried about the technical side. I'm worried about the funding side. Um, NASA funding going up lately has been absolutely fantastic, and that's a big help. Um, but if we want permanent human settlement, that's only going to happen with the power of 
of a free market economy. That's the only way you get that long-term permanent settlement. There has to be an economic value to it. Um, you know, we talk about the Apollo program as what we got from that was flags and footprints, right? Because it wasn't really a fort. You didn't stay. Um, and so this time we go to stay and to build that economic system. And that is going to be the key that gets us to permanence. You know, um, first and foremost, uh, you can have three variables like any good engineer, right? Political force, uh, technical force, economic force. And I think um, when we look at the opportunity of what the National Space Council has done, both as an American leadership perspective from a geopolitical standpoint in terms of deregulation to open up the aperture for, for opportunity of investment, and then as a leadership role for this country and NASA being just a tremendous resource for that, you see that in the last, you know, uh, over more than 30 years uh, ago with the International Space Station as a rallying point uh, geopolitically and then overall sustainability and then forward thinking in terms of what we can do and, and work on in space um, to create a, a lasting laboratory, a laboratory that over time is commercializing itself and creating those economic forces that will create that sustainability for the long term, I think is critically important. I'll, I think I'll give you my own personal example of having worked on the shuttle program you know, I was 18 when I was in the mission evaluation room working in the mission propulsion integration team. And the last shuttle landing was one of the toughest moments I will never forget in my life. Here we have this amazing technical workforce and it was the end of a program. And to have to come through that cycle, come on the backside and see the tremendous opportunity that exists in just 15 years of my career, of commercial crew, of uh, the space station as a commercialization element, as the space launch system and this great commercial uh, uh, and, and integrated strategy for the moon and onward to Mars is the most exciting era I've ever seen. And I'm seeing talent that may have, you know, taken a break for about three to five years because of the economic forces all coming back for the force of the greater good. Going through that and cherishing and understanding those tough moments and are the fuel necessary to take us forward. And so those are stories that as I look in this industry, those that have been through all of that is something I cherish and it helps provide that perspective for those who are investing in this new era of human space flight. I agree that we all have to come together around one priority that we're going forward and where we're going forward to. Um, it is uh, encouraging to me though that in general public opinion of NASA is very positive. People are very excited about space. Um, some people think we are much more highly funded than we actually are. Um, so sometimes we need to uh, let them know exactly where our national priorities are so that they can tell their representatives or their senators that, you know, we actually want more going toward this, this cool space stuff. Um, how much collaboration between the public and the private sectors do you think will occur when it comes to like, accepting events? So yeah, this, this goes back to my example earlier. I think that you have to have both. Both are critical if you want to have sustainability. Um, you know, the U.S. government is not going to continue to pay for a moon base forever, for especially as we start to move on to Mars. Um, and so, I think a great example of this, and I'll go ahead and plug one of my portfolio companies because you know that's what I do. Um, so, a company that's actually uh, they'll be here today, Axiom Space. They're based here in Houston, um, and they're building the commercial successor to the International Space Station. So as we um, move towards retirement of ISS, probably in the next decade or so, um, there will be a completely commercial space station to replace it. And that's the sort of um, idea and mentality that we need to have as we keep moving further out, um, that you know, the US government and other governments are great to go and, and build that first fort and plant that first flag. And then how do we work together um, towards the same goals of turning that over to um, to a commercially sustainable um, environment. Megan is right. A lot of times when the economic benefit or payoff of something isn't immediately clear, um, but say the scientific value is, it really helps when the government kickstarts that by saying, we believe in this, we're gonna give you the seed funding and you're gonna get started. And then once it starts, because people realize that this is actually going to work, or that they can make stuff off of this, then they start jumping in and then we're going to have a very good collaboration there. The, the part of this represents a pretty big sea change in the way NASA looks at doing things, right? 
If you go back to the Apollo era, or even all the way through shuttle and station era, NASA guided the, you know, we didn't actually build the hardware. I mean, most of you probably know this, NASA doesn't actually build a whole lot of hardware itself, okay? We, we, we give a lot of money to people like Boeing and Lockheed to build hardware for us. Um, but NASA tends to guide the development, they, they define the requirements, they, they tell people what to build, they essentially do everything except actually build the hardware. That doesn't necessarily create the kind of sustainable ecosystem that Megan's talking about. You need a very different approach towards creating a robust, vibrant economy that doesn't depend upon just NASA money to keep it flowing. So we're seeing NASA actually change. The program I'm running is trying to do that for lunar services. Now, bear in mind, not very many countries have landed on the moon yet, and yet we're going to try and get two small companies to do it in really less than a year from now, uh, maybe a year to a year and a half from now at the most. Um, and we're going to do it without NASA defining requirements, without NASA telling them how to build a lander. Basically, we're just going to hand them a payload and say, call us once on the moon, guys. So they have to figure all that out on their own. Now, you can make, you can argue whether well, that goes too far, it doesn't give enough them. And we'll kind of see how the results play that out. Commercial crew, commercial cargo, commercial lunar payload services, all of them represent somewhat different touch points, but they all have a similar theme. NASA's looking for the right way to engage in creating a sustainable economic infrastructure. Because the engine that drives this can't be government funding. It has to be a broader free enterprise market that drives all that. And when I think about, as I said earlier, about working across a portfolio, I have basically two very large uh, teams working on two very different sides of that same uh, argument. You know, number one, on the commercial crew side, uh, the requirements are provided by NASA at a top level, and then you go innovate, you go do, and do it in a way that's uh, low cost and sustainable from an economic perspective under the rules of the commercial crew program, per se, and the goals of the commercial crew program. And then you flip over, over on the SLS side and the Artemis rocket, and really pushing the boundaries of technologies and needs that you have to have to go around the the lunar um, environment, and HRO orbits, the gateway ecosystem, and then landing the first woman on the moon. And so uh, it really is different. It's been, a, honestly, personally, a, a pleasure to work on both sides because you understand both the risks uh, and the what some, some people might say a more serious approach to development, but it's also a representation of the difference between working on one side on the more commercially minded mindset and then the tougher side which is you're developing, you're paving, you're clearing out the, the, the trees to be able to pave the road and then at some point a commercial crew like program comes around and then you're managing the toll road uh, between two centers of economies. Um, and so those, those at, at the larger organizations that have been around since the inception of NASA, they really kind of get both sides and both influencers, whether you're an entrepreneurial side or on a more traditional side are good experiences to have when you're working on these long-term cycle businesses. Okay, and one more question that I have for you guys before we open the questions to the audience. Um, do you have any advice for students looking to work in the space industry? And what do you look for these students who want to work and get involved with your companies and organizations? Yeah. I'll start this one. Let me take a quick poll. Um, how many of you are engineering students? Um, <laughs> how many of you are math, finance, economics? Okay, we've got a couple. Um, science. There we go, there's the rest of them, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so um, I would say, you know, for, for the major, for almost any job, for almost any position, it's about who you know, right? Very rarely do people just get a job because they put in an application on a website. And the thing that was the most influential for me when I first started getting into this industry was volunteering. Volunteering with organizations that had like-minded people, right? Um, and so for me, that was a group called the Space Frontier Foundation. That's all about using the power of free enterprise to lift humanity permanently off world. And that resonated with me, being a finance and economics person, and so I started volunteering at their conferences. Um, next thing you know, I met the founder of that organization. And that person is now my business partner 10 years later. Um, so it all goes back to that first decision to, to, to volunteer at that conference. And that's you know how I built my network out that has helped me be very successful in my career. So if uh, Space Frontier Foundation sounds interesting to you, let me know. Um, also, there's a great conference that happens in Austin every year that I'm part of called the New Worlds Conference. 
um, and that's looking very far out. A lot of the questions that we were talking about here today are the types of things that are talked about at that conference. Um, it's about settlement of new worlds. Um, and that's in Austin every November. Great networking opportunity. Um, if you're interested in either of those, please come see me at the, uh, at the reception, and I'm happy to get you involved. So, so I would suggest students today have some opportunities that weren't around when I graduated from college. Um, if you wanted to work in the space business when I graduated, it was NASA or Des Moines or well, Lockheed, people like that. Donald Douglas was still around back then. But, but there is a large number of small new space companies out there. You all should be paying attention to them. That's where a lot of the interesting, exciting, innovative work is happening. It's also where opportunity is going to emerge. Don't get me wrong, it's fine to work for NASA, it's great to work for the big companies too. We all need more engineers, that's not a problem. But you all will have opportunities to work in a much wider range of environments for a much more diverse community of companies than was true a few years back. That's a great point, Chris, and I'd just like to point out that the Space Frontier Foundation's annual conference is called New Space, um, and it's uh, one of the larger gatherings of those new space companies. One more, I'm done. <laughs> We are New Space too. let's put that on the record here. Uh, when I joined the Boeing company 15 years ago, yeah, it was kind of the, the back end of that cycle, uh, working on traditional, what some people would call a traditional human spaceflight program. Today, it is a whole new world order, and that is something that you don't know when you apply to one of the big companies when you come in. Um, we have a, an investment arm, uh, Boeing Horizon X, looking at companies that are on the entrepreneurial side to be able to work with and bring the knowledge capital that comes with working in this human spaceflight business. We uh, invested recently with, um, uh, I believe it was Virgin Galactic, um, in terms of creating the ecosystem of which it would operate in the future uh, opportunities of uh, suborbital human spaceflight. And at the same time, I have to turn around and then go speak on the far edge of the NASA investments in, in the uh, multi-country uh, approaches of the International Space Station and the Space Launch System. As a mechanical engineer having come in, turning into a systems engineer, a propulsion engineer, then transitioning over to a human factors engineer, and then turning that leaf over um, and, and getting the perspectives from crew like Nicole Mann, like Mike Fink, like astronaut Chris Ferguson, and then flipping that over and then speaking about the investment opportunities and long-range business plans and long-range investment necessary in partnership with NASA to go make these giant leaps happen. That is my day in, a, in an hour, in a two hours. And so when I think about what it takes to come into this industry, number one, never lose, my first boss said it, never lose it. A, number one, a curiosity and a spark to go learn. It doesn't end when you walk across the stage at Rice. Two, the people in network, both from a historical perspective, because that is so integral in terms of the North Star of what we are all doing here. And then, and then third, uh, go vote. Go understand the environment in which you're working in as an engineer. You do not know how important your voice is as a technical individual in this community to help drive what we are all looking and going to, and most importantly, understand the forces at play um, in terms of creating this green soil, which we're going to go plant this amazing tree for all of humanity. Um, I love what I do every single day. We are always hiring, and I can absolutely talk about uh, to you about all the places we work and play, from Silicon Valley all the way to the Space Coast. I would say, in general, just be persistent for everything. I have a lot of colleagues who've said they've tried to get into JPL several times before it actually worked out for them, but there they are now. Um, and I guess my plug for JPL, our summer internship program also has several hundred people in it, and the application deadline is the end of March, um, so you do still have time to do that. Um, and also, if you're interested in space, definitely apply to all the space companies, all the small space companies, as Chris mentioned, but don't limit your search there, because it doesn't hurt you to have, say, experience in an oil company or experience being an engineer in a, in a uh, car company and then transferring into space. That doesn't rule you out. So it's actually, in my personal opinion, better to have some level of experience in something, even if it's not space.
question was the similarities to the emergence of the airline industry in the 1920s. What a lot of people don't know about the airline industry is that what made it profitable, what made it actually happen, was the US government gave several of the airlines contracts for mail delivery, right? Air mail, right? That, that was what supported the airlines until people were confident enough to actually get on that scary thing in the sky and uh, take off the ground, right? Um, and so that's exactly what you're seeing here, right? With NASA buying um, rides to the space station for both cargo and crew, um, they're becoming that anchor customer that's allowing SpaceX and Boeing to develop these, um, these commercial systems that will have tourists flying on them within the next year to 18 months. Um, so it's, it is very similar, and, and the anchor government customer, and, and not so much you know government grants and government funding, that's all great and wonderful and, and great for startups, but it's having that consistent customer that just pays for a service. Um, it isn't in the middle like we were talking about. It's not, um, you know, issuing a whole bunch of requirements. The government's just paying for a service, and that's how you get an industry like this started. necessary to accomplish, you know, they're essentially facilitating the current market. So government investment to push technologies forward so that industry can follow is actually very critical. I also think it's unlikely you'll see the companies take some big risks, flying humans to Mars, other than, other than Elon, maybe Elon would do it, but other than Elon, there aren't a whole lot of companies willing to take that level of risk because the level of investment is so large. Um, Tony talked about SLX. SLS is a good example of really pushing the boundaries of launch capabilities well past what the commercial market needs to put small stuff into low Earth orbit. So that kind of government investment seems highly likely, and that's where I think you'll see places like NASA pushing down the road. But we, if we're doing things well, we're turning it over to the commercial side more rapidly than we've done in our past. Oh. Um, what do you Okay, so let me understand. Uh, the challenge is essentially the, 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 the space weather, the environment of Mars, and what, what challenges that poses to the people in particular? Okay, yeah, so, so let's start with the big one, radiation. Okay, we take for granted that radiation protection because of our atmosphere and the magnetic belts around Earth protect us in ways that you aren't protected if you go into deep space. And that applies not just to humans, but to hardware as well. Now we're doing a little better job of handling how the hardware can be protected. You're at the hardware and enough lead, it's usually well protected. But that's hard to wrap humans in enough lead to make them protected. So, so radiation protection in particular is one of the things we spend a lot of energy trying to understand, and part of the problem is we don't really know a lot about it. You can't experience it on Earth, and for some, some reason we aren't allowed to expose humans you know, in, in nuclear reactors to these kinds of things. <laughs> Um, so, so finding solutions to those kinds of problems, which are inherent in the space environment, I think is one of the big ones. We also have a definite temperature problem on Mars. Um, the temperature between midday and nighttime is very extreme. Um, and so you have to make sure that you don't have, say, temper temperature differentials between the different materials in your habitat because you don't want certain things to shrink or grow in ways that they won't 
stay together. Um, Mars also has not much of an atmosphere. It's about 1% of the density of Earth's, um, which is interesting, right? The moon doesn't really have much of an atmosphere, so you couldn't actually fly a helicopter on the moon. Uh, you can fly one on Mars, but the Martian atmosphere, we say it's not that, it's not enough to really slow down a spacecraft that's coming into land, but it's enough that it's a problem and you have to deal with the heating. That's why we have to have the heat shield on the rover when it's coming in, because just like when you're landing on Earth, you get that friction heating. Um, so you have to be able to deal with that atmosphere. It's also uh, the base um, gas is CO2, unlike the nitrogen that we have on Earth. So obviously, you, you know, you're gonna have to deal with pressurizing your habitats, your suits, and all that stuff. And now you have Martian dust um, it blows a little bit, probably not enough to really be blowing things over, unlike a certain movie we can all remember, um, but enough to get it everywhere, and if you are um, moving things and dust don't really go together very well, so you have to know how to seal things and keep it clean um, and not get all that Martian regolith. First off, simple answers, I don't think we know. Um, NASA had, there's actually a fun video that goes around, and I don't know how many people have seen it, that asks, you know, which, which planet has studied, NASA studied more than any other planet in the solar system? And it turns out the answer is Earth. So we, do a, we actually spend more money on Earth observation than we do on any other planet. Um, and, and obviously we're a part of the political infrastructure of the country, so we're driven by things that, that, that have, um, residents at the political level, you know, both the White House and Congress. But NASA's budget for Earth observation has stayed pretty steady for many, many years. Um, like other parts of NASA, it doesn't show massive growth, but it is staying steady. The harder discussion on all these things is reaching the consensus on what the right measurements to take are, and, and you know, when, when it's fairly easy to define 17 missions that would help us better understand what's happening to Earth's climate, for example. But we've only got funding to do two of them. And, and so it really is, from my personal opinion, I haven't seen a lot of evidence that NASA has been pushed away from that kind of work. I think we're still spending as heavily as we have in the past. Um, but it is very hard to reach consensus on what the right missions are within the budgets available to us. Okay, thank you so much.